this hearing of the uh, Select Committee on Energy Independence and um, Global Warming is called to order. Uh, yesterday, President Bush addressed the Washington International Renewable Energy Conference to once again say that the United States has to get off oil. But this administration's rhetoric does not match the reality that is continuing to defend big oil at the expense of American consumers, our economy and the planet. After nearly eight years of this administration's backwards energy policy, the oil companies now have us over a barrel. Today, after OPEC refused to answer President Bush's plea to open the spigots, oil prices broke yet another all-time record, rising above $105 per barrel, up from $30 a barrel when President Bush took office. And consumers are paying the price at the pump. Gas prices have now reached a nationwide average of $3.18, more than doubling since the President took office. The prospect of $4 uh, gas may be news to the President, but it is not news to the American people, who are being tipped upside down every time they fill up. Skyrocketing energy prices are also hurting the U.S. economy. The Department of Labor reported that the economy lost 17,000 jobs in January, the first monthly decline in four years. But we have a new driver of economic growth and job creation waiting to be unleashed. We are on the cusp of a renewable energy revolution. Last year, we led the world by installing 5,244 megawatts of new wind power, roughly 30 percent of all new electricity generation installed in the United States. Solar photovoltaic installation also grew by more than 80 percent in 2007. Transitioning to a green economy has the potential to create hundreds of thousands of green jobs generating economic opportunity everywhere from the hearts of our cities to the heartland of our country. An analysis by the Clean Tech Venture Network estimated that as many as 500,000 new green jobs could be created by 2010. But the tax incentives that have driven this growth of renewable energy are poised to expire once again. In recent years, when these tax incentives have been allowed to lapse, the impact has been dramatic. For example, New wind installation dropped between 77 and 93 percent each of the three times that the production tax credit expired since 2000. If we do not provide certainty to investors by extending these tax incentives early this year, we are likely to see the recent growth of renewable energy grind to a halt. Our economy and our planet cannot afford it. If the tax credits for solar and wind expire this year, it will lead to an estimated $19 billion in lost investments and 116,000 lost job opportunities through 2009. Last week, the House passed legislation that would repeal unnecessary tax breaks for the largest oil companies and use those funds to extend those vital tax incentives for wind, solar and other renewable technologies. But rather than join the overwhelming bipartisan majority supporting this bill that would begin to restore the long-term health of our economy and our planet, the Bush administration is continuing to stand with big oil in opposition. In April of 2005, President Bush said, quote, with $55 a barrel oil, we don't need incentives for oil and gas companies to explore. Well, now, with that price nearly double, our economy on the brink of recession and our planet's thermometer rising, it is time for this administration to finally back up its rhetoric and support incentives for wind and other renewables that will reduce global warming pollution, not make it worse, create jobs rather than hurt consumers, and turn our economy green rather than push it deeper into the red. Uh, and now uh, I would like to turn and recognize the ranking uh, member of the Select Committee, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. As I have said many times, promoting and advancing technology must be a key part of any global warming or energy security policy. And I am pleased that the Chairman has scheduled this hearing today on renewable energy technology. This week, people came to Washington from all over the world to talk about renewable energy. President Bush addressed the Washington International Renewable Energy Conference yesterday, not to mention the scores of other government and business leaders who are here to examine the future of worldwide renewable energy production. 
The reason that everybody is talking about renewable energy production is because its future role is a vital part of the world's economy. Traditional fossil fuels are and will remain a key source of worldwide energy production. But just like a strong investment portfolio includes a diverse group of stocks and bonds, future energy portfolios should include a diverse array of energy technologies, including fossil fuels, renewable energy, and nuclear power. On that point, I am happy that the Chairman has also scheduled a hearing for next week on nuclear energy technology. Nuclear power is safe, clean, and produces no greenhouse gases. It, too, must be part of a diverse energy portfolio. But diversity is the key. When it comes to energy security or environmental protection, different energy technologies work better in different places. Each has its benefits and each has its drawbacks. For example, wind energy is a promising source of clean, renewable power. But the wind doesn't blow consistently, and some areas are better for wind power than others. As Interior Secretary Dirk Kempthorne noted at the conference yesterday, wind farms can hurt bird populations, some of which are already under stress. The Audubon Society has noted that the average population of common birds has declined 70 percent since 1967. So placing wind farms in places that will harm bird operations, bird populations, does not advance the cause of renewable energy, Secretary Kempthorne said, and I agree. In the right places, wind farms will be a great source of renewable energy, but the shoe doesn't fit every footprint. Likewise, solar power is a great resource, but mostly in areas where large tracts of land are available for use and the sun shines consistently. These should be just two options in a diverse energy portfolio. The Energy Information Administration recently reported to the Senate its projections for future energy production and the use of renewables in the U.S. will nearly double by 2030. But even then, renewable energy won't produce as much electricity as nuclear power currently does. The nuclear power only accounts for about 20 percent of the nation's electricity production. That's why maintaining a diverse energy resources is a top priority. By focusing on energy technologies like renewables and nuclear, combined with energy efficiency, the U.S. can meet many of the principles I believe are vital for any global warming policy. These technologies can help produce verifiable environmental benefits, and development of these technologies can help create jobs and improve the economy, which everybody agrees is a good thing. I thank the witnesses for coming to enlighten us about the status of these technologies. I look forward to hearing more about them and yield back the balance of my time. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, uh, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In 319 days, the United States will begin a new era where we will, no matter who is elected President, Mr. McCain, Ms. Clinton, Mr. Obama, we will have a Federal Government that is no longer resisting working with the rest of the world on issues of climate change and global warming. Uh, and there are strong signals that we will be moving more aggressively into a carbon-constrained economy. Uh, there are those that talk about the future. I think our witnesses here today will demonstrate that that era is here now in terms of not just the promise of renewable energy, but its practice. And I, I had a chance to review some of the testimony. I'm familiar with some of what's going on. I think this is an important statement about where we are. It is interesting that the era is here. The Federal Government needs to catch up. The Federal Government can learn from some of our witnesses about how to be a more sophisticated customer for energy. The Federal Government, as the largest consumer of energy in the world, has an opportunity to change dramatically not just our carbon footprint, but bring many of these things to scale. We need to have a broad policy framework, like a renewable portfolio standard, that would help accelerate this in a way that it, it enhances the market. Last but not least, we need to realign our massive array of tax subsidies. The production tax credit you have referenced will be extended this year. It is outrageous that it has taken this long, and it is not something that is done on a multi-year basis rather than guessing year to year. Uh, we clearly do not need to give as much of a subsidy to the large oil companies that have found a way to make a profit, but there are some 
industries and technologies that are here today with a little bit of federal assistance could make a big difference with a fraction of that money. I look forward to the hearing and appreciate your arraying it in this way. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Shattuck. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for holding this hearing. Uh, I would like to start by wel welcoming a very important witness here today. Bar Ms. Barbara Lockwood is the manager of renewable energy at Arizona Public Service Company. Barbara is here to talk about a new project that I'm very proud of that Arizona Public Service Company has just announced. Uh, it is the construction of the largest solar power plant in the world in my home state of Arizona. Barbara, thank you for being here. I can't pass up this opportunity to tout the advertising campaign that is making Arizonans aware of this project. They take a weatherman, he's a, not a real weatherman, put him on camera and say, you know, here's the forecast for the next three days. Sunny, hot, sunny, 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 hot. Next week it'll be sunny, hot, sunny, sunny, hot. And in <laughs> June it will be sunny, hot, sunny. If you're getting married in August, however, it'll rain. <laughs> he pauses and says, no, just kidding, it'll be sunny and hot. Uh, the Arizona people are embracing that campaign, and I am very excited about this project. I want to compliment uh, Arizona Public Service. Uh, obviously, technology is a part of the path forward. Solar energy needs to be a part of the path forward. Uh, and Arizona is emblematic of this entire issue because in Arizona we have tremendous growth. The state is the second fastest growing in the nation. The city in which I live and represent is one of the fastest growing in the nation. And I am thrilled that we are moving forward uh, both with technology uh, in every area, but also particularly with technology and renewables. In that uh, vein, I'd like to point out something that has become a, at least a little bit of a trademark of my own, Mr. Chairman. I know yours is uh, brilliantly funny opening statements. Uh, you may recall that years ago, uh, I, we did a hearing on renewables in the Commerce Committee, and I brought in the uh, hydrologic cycle. And I want to point out, I took it out of a uh, third grade text <coughs> or a fifth grade text. Uh, we were discussing at that time uh, the issue of renewable energy. And uh, in that particular piece of legislation, hydro was not considered renewable energy. And so I brought, I went to one of my staffers whose wife taught grade school. And I said, does she happen to have a copy of the hydrologic cycle in a textbook and they said sure let's see if we can find one and they found this one and of course it shows you know uh, rain evaporating up out of the ocean uh, coming into the uh, clouds the clouds move over the land and then come back down uh, I would argue that uh, we need to focus on the fact that uh, hydropower needs to be an important part of this entire discussion uh, it is one of the single most efficient forms of renewable energy uh, Ninety percent of the available energy for my hydropower plant can be converted into electricity. It is emissions free, Mr. Chairman, so it addresses the issue of a carbon footprint. And I would urge my colleagues here, as they look at renewable energy, to focus on that. There are new possibilities of in-stream flow. In the old day, days when we thought about hydropower, we thought about you have to build a dam and put a turbine in the dam and then let the water out of the dam and there are environmental consequences. We've actually gotten better since then. We can now do in-stream flow. I just want to conclude with one fact. Today in Arizona, uh, Glen Canyon Dam is producing one-third less power than it is capable of because of environmental damage downstream. That is the equivalent of two coal or natural gas powered plants and their carbon footprint. If we were more innovative, if we used technology to a greater degree, we could create a second downstream, uh, downstream a second dam, operate that solely for environmental purposes, operate Glen Canyon Dam uh, for, hydro, for hydroelectricity purposes, and eliminate the need for those two coal-fired plants. Uh, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I regrettably have another hearing that I'll have to attend and will miss part of this hearing, but I commend you for holding it. And again, I uh, commend Arizona Public Service and Ms. Lockwood for her testimony. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Solis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank the witnesses for being here this morning as well. I, too, have another conflicting hearing that I'll, I'll have to uh, leave to attend to. But I just wanted to uh, touch on um, the economic crisis that we're facing across the country, but particularly in areas like mine. We just heard from the Department of Labor in their recent reports that we've lost about 17,000 jobs in, in uh, January. In my district in East Los Angeles and Southern California, 
uh, unemployment has reached above 7.2 percent, and we still don't have an accurate figure for a lot of our youth that have also been unemployed. We have seen uh, high levels of poverty, homelessness, and the last thing that people want to talk about is the uh, going to the gasoline station and having to fill up and putting in more than $50 to fill up half a tank. Um, the prices there are outrageous, above $3.60 per gallon. A recent report that we know in the American Solar Energy Society estimated back in 2006 that renewable energy in the energy sector generated, however, 8.5 million jobs, nearly a trillion dollars in revenue to the United States. And jobs in these sectors, as we know, provide livable wages above the minimum wage and in many cases will not be outsourced. They will be jobs that can stay here on our shores. In this time of economic turbulence, it is important that we support those sectors of our economy that are providing that incentive. And I am proud that last week the House passed the Renewable Energy and Energy Conservation Tax Act. I heard personally from many of our medium and small-sized businesses in Los Angeles at a recent event I held at the East LA Skills Center where we are finding that individuals are getting involved in uh, training segments of our society that would otherwise not have an opportunity to get involved in placement and development of solar panels. And there were many people there, businesses that were pleading with me, Congresswoman, when is the Federal Government going to provide relief so we can provide the kinds of funds, a capital investment so that we can prolong these kinds of jobs. My answer to them is I will do whatever I can as a, as a part of the uh, member of Congress here that serves on this committee, but also ask them to also talk to our President and to the other side of the aisle, because in, indeed this is something that affects all of us. I look forward to hearing from you. I know that we have a lot to do. Um, green collar jobs is an area that I have been working on. The President did sign a bill that would allow for $125 billion to be spent to create at least at a minimum 3 million jobs. Again, those jobs are very important to us. Help us. Let's step up to the plate. And I look forward to hearing from each and every one of you. Thank you. General Lady's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the hearing. I would like to express appreciation to uh, our August uh, panel today. Uh, let me apologize in advance. I am going to be running in and out. I am on the Financial Services uh, Committee, which is right around the corner. And it starts at 10, so I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll be shuttling uh, in between. Uh, but I I, I uh, appreciate your presence here, and I appreciate the fact that we are uh, dealing with this uh, energy, uh, renewable energies uh, issue, and the, the the need to create green jobs. As the federal government becomes more and more sensitive, and I think Mr. Blumenauer is actually is absolutely right. It doesn't matter who president is, we're going to. Uh, move uh, deeper and uh, necessarily uh, into the, the world that is becoming uh, green conscious. And uh, we are going to need to create uh, green jobs. The, the committee I am on, which also deals with housing and, uh, and oversight for uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, we are now requiring that all new HUD uh, housing uh, uh, contain or be built with uh, uh, architects by architects who uh, create uh, green houses. And I think you are going to see more and more legislation uh, containing uh, components that will require the greening of whatever, however we are spending our Federal dollars. Uh, and so if we are going to do that, uh, it seems to me that we need to uh, create people who can handle those jobs, people who can put in solar panels. Uh, I live in a, in a city, one of the largest cities geographically in the country, 322 square miles, with more circumferential highways than any other city per capita in the United States. We have one E85 service station uh, in that large uh, uh, area. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm told I drive an E85 car uh, that, uh, that, that we are going to have a shortage of mechanics, for example, who can work on hybrids uh, and E85 vehicles. And so we are, we are going to move into this new era, and, we, uh, un and unless we uh, make preparations now, we are not going to have the workers uh, who are going to be able to do the jobs uh, to, to sustain the era we are trying to create. And so hopefully uh, you will be able to help provide us with uh, some direction today uh, that we might be able to, to use as we further uh, sensitize uh, Congress. 
uh, and the nation uh, on the necessary uh, changes that we've got to make as a nation. I yield back to ba balance of my time. Great. The gentleman's time has expired, and uh, all time for opening statements by members of the Select Committee has expired. But we see that we have a guest here, Elliot Engel, Congressman from New York. And uh, would the gentleman like to be recognized? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'll be, I'll be very brief, and, and uh, thank you for letting me uh, participate. And um, this is obviously very important. I look forward to um, hearing uh, all the uh, witnesses this morning, uh, especially uh, my friend uh, Bianca Jagger, Chair of the World Future Council. Bianca has um, fought for many years for, uh, for human rights as a human rights activist, and in many ways um, we are um, talking about, about human rights, because if we do uh, what we are supposed to do with uh, renewable energy, uh, it is certainly a, uh, a win uh, for everybody. I was uh, looking at the um, at the uh, notes that passed out, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, and um, one of the things that caught my eye is renewable energy tends to have higher construction and maintenance costs and lower or zero fuel costs, while fossil energy has the reverse cost structure. As a result, renewable energy technologies lead to a higher number of jobs per unit of energy generated compared to conventional fossil fuels. The construction, manufacturing, installation, operation and maintenance jobs produced by a megawatt of photovoltaic solar, for example, is 7 to 11 times greater than the number of jobs generated by an equivalent amount of coal or gas-generated electricity. So we are talking about uh, uh, clean air, we are talking about uh, helping with global warming, and we are talking about creating new jobs and driving economic growth. Uh, it is certainly, in my opinion, the, the direction that, that our country should, uh, should go in. We ignore global warming, obviously, uh, at our own peril. And I believe that tax incentives for renewable energy is certainly the way to go. And I am glad, as Ms. Solis said, that last week uh, we passed a bill uh, giving tax incentives, uh, renewable energy and the Energy uh, Tax Act. Uh, I really believe only government can drive this, and that is why this, this hearing this morning is so important. So I thank you uh, for letting me participate, and I am eagerly awaiting the testimony of our witnesses. Thank, thank you, Mr. You, and, Chairman. And we welcome you, uh, sir, to this uh, hearing. And that uh, completes uh, the opening statements. We will now turn to our very distinguished witnesses. And our first one is Mr. Vic Abate, who is the Vice President for Renewable Energy from uh, uh, General uh, Electric. Um, uh, uh, this has been an incredible growth story. We are looking forward to hearing more about it. Uh, you have five minutes, uh, Mr. Abate, whenever you are ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I appreciate this opportunity to testify on renewable energy, the economy, its, its potential to stimulate investment and job creation, and the critical importance of government policy in realizing this potential. Uh, GE Energy is a power generation technology leader with more than 100 years of industry experience. Our global team consists of 36,000 employees. We operate in over 700 sites and in more than 100 countries. Our power generation business is a diverse portfolio consisting of thermal, gasification, nuclear and renewable energy technologies such as wind, solar and biomass. With energy demand increasing dramatically and growing worldwide pressure to address greenhouse gas emissions, GE believes firmly that renewable energy must become an integral part of the 21st century energy mix. Supportive government policy has enabled the U.S. to become the global leader in new wind power installations. Last year, uh, the U.S. added over 5,000 megawatts, over 25 percent of the world's total uh, wind power, and that is up from 55 megawatts a decade ago, so tremendous growth. The U.S. installed over 45 percent, uh, the installed base grew over 45 percent and now totals 16.8 gigawatts in 34 states and accounts for over 1 percent of the nation's electricity supply and powers over 4.5 million homes from this resource. Wind power accounted for 30 percent of all nameplate generation capacity added in the United States last year, second only to natural gas. And the U.S. is on pace to surpass Germany and become the nation with the largest installed base of wind power by the end of 2009. The growth in wind energy is creating real economic, energy security and environmental benefits. According to the American Wind Energy Association, last year the industry spurred $9 billion of investment and created more than 50,000 new jobs. Much of this job growth has occurred in areas that have been hardest hit by manufacturing job losses. The installed base for wind power also displaces 3 percent of the natural gas consumption and avoids the emissions of 28 million tons of carbon dioxide from traditional power plants, equaling uh, the equivalent of taking 6 million cars off the road. 
Policy-driven growth of the wind industry in the U.S. has helped GE expand its wind business revenues from less than a billion in 2004 to more than six billion this year. Over 8,000 of GE's 1.5 megawatt wind turbines have been installed worldwide, a number expected to exceed 10,000 by the end of this year. Since entering the wind industry in 2002, GE has invested over $700 million in technology, increasing its wind turbine production sixfold and tripled its U.S. wind turbine assembly sites. We have expanded capacity from about 10 wind turbines per week to making 13 a day, and we have grown renewable energy jobs at GE to more than 2,700. GE has also tripled the number of its suppliers who now account for in excess of 2,000 U.S. jobs and cover 15 states. We see significant future job creation potential from wind energy and estimate that sustaining the growth rate we have seen over the past five years for the next five would triple the size of the industry and of the associated jobs. To realize the potential for wind power, we must meet three challenges, technology, supply chain and policy. The cost of wind electricity has dropped 80 percent over the past 20 years, and GE's technology investments in efficiency, reliability and grid integration will continue to improve the competitive, competitiveness of wind power. GE is also driving supplier quality and wind industry through its lean manufacturing and Six Sigma processes. The most critical challenge facing the U.S. wind industry is policy uncertainty. Long-term, stable, predictable incentives reward innovation and enable technology manufacturers and suppliers to invest and expand capacity to keep up with the growing demand. The current growth of the U.S. wind market is underpinned by the repeated extensions in 2005 and 2006 of the Federal Production Tax Credit that is set to expire at the end of 2008. Expiration of the tax credit would have a devastating impact on the domestic wind industry. Prior expirations at the end of 1999, 2001 and 2003 reduced wind power uh, installations by the, in the following year by 73 to 93 percent. A report estimates that failure to extend the credit this year would cause a 90 percent drop in wind installations, resulting in $11.5 billion lost investment and 76,000 job opportunities in 17 states in 2009 alone. Jobs that might have been created in the United States could shift instead to overseas areas like Europe and China, which are strengthening their wind policies. In summary, GE believes that the United States is well positioned to benefit from the growth of the renewable energy industry. However, continued growth of this industry is dependent on stable, predictable policy. We urge the U.S. to act, the U.S. Congress to act immediately and extend the existing production tax credit for wind energy. Thank you for this opportunity to present this testimony, and I look forward to your questions. Right. Thank you, Mr. Bay, very much. Our second witness. Uh, uh, is uh, the senior director for uh, solar uh, markets and uh, public uh, policy uh, for um, the applied materials, Mr. Blair Sweezy. Whenever you're ready, sir, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Could you turn on your microphone, oh, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, for providing us with the opportunity to testify today. We are very pleased to present our corporate perspective on the potential of the solar industry to, to create domestic jobs while at the same time providing an important solution to some of our most pressing energy and environmental needs. Applied Materials is a Fortune 500 company headquartered in Silicon Valley that employs approximately 14,500 workers worldwide, including nearly 8,000 here in the United States, with additional production facilities. Uh, I'm sorry, our primary manufacturing uh, facilities are in Austin, Texas, with additional facilities in Germany and Israel. We sell more than 80 percent of our products outside the United States, making us an important positive contributor to the U.S. balance of trade. We recently celebrated our 40th year as a company and have a proud heritage of providing productivity enhancing nano manufacturing tools and equipment to the semiconductor and flat panel display industries. We have now extended this technology and manufacturing expertise to providing the tools for production of solar electric, photovoltaic or PV modules. We see considerable growth potential in the rapidly expanding solar market. Our technology and production scale helped reduce the cost of transistors by a factor of 20 million between 1974 and today. Similarly, the price of flat panel displays has dropped by a factor of 20 in the past decade. We fully expect to have the same impact on driving cost reductions for PV pr panel production by a factor of two to three, which will put solar electricity prices on par with grid power prices for large areas of the world. The key is getting to large-scale manufacturing by creating large markets. The sheer magnitude of our energy supply challenges, meeting continued global demand growth while assuring economic prosperity, domestic energy security, and environmental quality, dictates that we accelerate the, devel the development of all available energy resource options. 
The question is not one of renewable resource availability, but of the economics of deploying the technologies to exploit these resources and how rapidly industry can ramp up the manufacturing capacity to produce the technologies. First to economics. Electricity generation from photovoltaics is currently anywhere from two to three times more expensive than electricity generation from conventional sources. Nevertheless, global PV production has been growing at a rapid clip, rising at a rate of more than 40 percent per year over the past decade. This growth is a direct result of government policies that have been established here in the United States and around the globe. In the U.S., the Energy Policy Act of 2005 established a 30 percent investment tax credit, or ITC, for residential solar installations and raised the existing business energy ITC from 10 percent to 30 percent. A reduction in the credit would absolutely send the wrong signal to the investment community that is so critical in providing the capital for solar industry expansion. And so we commend the House of Representatives for its recent action in passing H.R. 5351, which includes extension of these tax credits and other important changes. The other key element is domestic jobs and economic development. The solar industry creates manufacturing jobs with labor that is readily transferable from other manufacturing industries. The United States is already a base for solar panel manufacturers and dozens of new startup operations. Applied Materials itself now employs about 900 employees in its Energy and Environmental Solutions Group, which is just two and a half years old. While overall U.S. manufacturing job numbers continue to decline, renewable energy industries offer a whole new generation of manufacturing job potential. However, the fact that companies develop the technology here in the United States does not guarantee that they will also locate the production here in the United States. Achieving the job creation potential of the solar industry depends on continuing policy support to build the market. The Solar Energy Industries Association, of which Applied Materials is a member, estimates that extending the current set of federal solar tax credits will create 55,000 new jobs in the solar industry and more than $45 billion in economic investment. Conversely, a recent study by Navigant Consulting estimated that failure to extend the credits will cost the country nearly 40,000 jobs and more than $8 billion of investment just through 2009. Industry will locate where production conditions are most favorable and manufacturers are also likely to invest and locate close to where viable end markets exist. However, companies need to see a clear market growth pathway to commit the substantial resources needed to ramp production capacity and output. Unfortunately, in the case of PB manufacturing, many U.S. companies are increasingly looking abroad to expand their production, in part because of the uncertainty over future policy support. Speaking from our own corporate experience, 100 percent of our solar factory orders have come from outside the United States. So while our domestic business is advancing, the opportunity for a much larger U.S. industry platform is idle. In summary, the PV industry is currently transitioning from one of component assembly operations to large-scale manufacturing, which will dramatically increase the scale and throughput of PV module production in coming years. Solar photovoltaics is following a well-documented pattern of cost decline and with new technology, technology approaches is poised to create an accelerated cost reduction path. With our abundance of solar and other renewable energy resources, we are presented with the opportunity to manufacture our way toward domestic energy security and sustainability. As a nation, we need to seize this opportunity. Applied Materials will do its part to make America competitive in this important and growing industry, and we stand ready to work with policymakers to develop a sound policy framework that will enable us and other innovative U.S. companies to lead the way. This concludes my prepared remarks, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak before you thank, today. Thank you, Mr. Sweezy. Our next witness is uh, Mr. Bill Unger uh, from the Mayfield Fund, and he is here representing environmental entrepreneurs. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. Um, I'm a partner emeritus at Mayfield Fund. We're a venture partnership. Could you move that investing. microphone up a little bit more okay. uh, closer, please? I'm part of a venture partnership that's invested in technology companies since 1970. I'm also a member of Environmental Entrepreneurs, which is an organization, a volunteer organization, 800 members across 25 states who believe that good environmental policy is good economic policy. I'd like to thank the chairman, members of this committee in the House for their work in passing the Renewable Energy and Energy Conservation Tax Act, the extension of these incentives that provides an even playing field for all technologies is vital for our nation. We also hope that the Senate and the President will cooperate and pass this into law. It's a critical step to solving our urgent and intimately related problems of dependence on foreign energy, our economic growth, and climate change. For example, today, each 10-gallon fill-up at the pump has been calculated as adding an additional $2.10 
to as much as $11 per gallon when the full cost of tax incentives, the $50 billion cost for protecting shipping lanes of oil, and health and environmental costs are fully loaded, and this is exclusive of the cost of the war. We add these dollars to our debt or pay in other ways to the tune of an additional $20 to $100 per tankful that is not evident at that particular point. Also, since the Energy Policy Act of 2005 was passed, which granted $6 billion of incentives to the oil industry, the oil industry has spent $112 billion repurchasing their shares on the open market. We would like to see a more even playing field. I appreciate this opportunity to discuss with you the benefits of investment in clean tech, jobs, economic growth, and an improved environment. The need to address climate change is immediate. Because of the magnitude of this challenge, this new industrial revolution properly addressed could create more jobs, more economic prosperity, more personal, investor, corporate, and public servant satisfaction than has ever been seen for any number of the exciting technological innovations of the past. The venture industry is proud of its role in job creation and bringing new technologies to market. In 2006, venture-backed companies provided 10.4 million U.S. jobs, and these companies had revenues of $2.3 trillion, and we are excited about clean tech. The analysis it sounds like most of you are familiar with from UC Berkeley concludes, the renewable energy sector generates more jobs, whether it is measured on per megawatt of power installed, per unit of energy produced, or per dollar of investment in fossil fuel-based energy sector. E2 estimates U.S. clean tech investment by 2010 will be $14 to $19 billion and will create an additional 400,000 to 600,000 jobs. This is a big opportunity. How does it start? Often with the wealth of technologies generated at our own national laboratories and our universities, these are national resources. Really, there are treasures. DARPA and NIH play a crucial role nurturing technology development until the venture industry, which invests in product development, becomes interested. Our tax dollars paid for much of the pioneering work in solar and wind technology at our national labs. Much of the basic work for the hybrid engines on the road today was done at Stanford University. Yet we are not the leaders in these fields. Germany, Denmark, Taiwan, and Japan seize these opportunities and are prospering. Since the energy crisis of the 70s, federal energy research spending is down significantly. And is this important? The market caps of Ford and General Motors are $13 billion each, and they are encouraging their employees to find other work. Toyota has a $176 billion market cap, and they have record employment. With an even playing field in terms of policy and federally funded R&D and a variety of technologies, we can regain market leadership. The semiconductor industry in the 1980s regained world leadership from this, exactly this kind of public-private partnership. There is a high degree of technical knowledge spillover from the semiconductor and software industries to clean tech. Many of the entrepreneurs from these fields are now entering the clean tech industry. Their experience is an unmatched resource in the world. So this is a great story. Clean tech investors love it. In 2006, $2.9 billion was invested in clean tech, 76 percent increase over the previous year. Clean tech is now the third largest venture investment segment. The barriers that keep clean tech from growing fast enough to head off the climate crisis are inconsistent policy, long term subsidies for conventional industries, and trade barriers. These have to be corrected. A mandatory, comprehensive national cap on greenhouse gas emissions a national renewable energy standard, and increased R&D funding are necessary. But these measures should not preempt states from going even further if they so choose. The Manhattan Project, the Marshall Plan, Space Program, Roosevelt's Rural Electrification Program, and Eisenhower's Interstate Highway System are all examples of strong and visionary federal leadership. And unlike the Apollo Program and the Manhattan Project, we can do this with existing technologies. We need to be the people the world have been waiting for. We need to be the people our children will say made the right decisions to give their children a safer, healthier, and more prosperous place to live. I look forward to your questions. Great. We thank you, uh, sir, very much. Uh, next uh, witness is Ms. Barbara Lockwood, who is the manager of, for renewable energy for the Arizona Public Service uh, Company. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, Thank you for the opportunity to provide APS's perspective on the economic benefits of renewable energy. As Congressman Chaddick mentioned, Arizona is the second fastest growing state in the country, growing at three times the national average. 
APS has more than a million customers who at their peak consume over 7,000 megawatts of electricity. And that electricity demand is growing at a rate of hundreds of megawatts each and every year. In Arizona, our most abundant renewable resource is sunshine, and APS is looking for ways to put the sun to work providing electricity. APS is committed to making Arizona the solar capital of the world. The focus of my comments today are on a particular type of solar technology called concentrating solar power, or CSP, which is different than the photovoltaic systems or solar panels that you typically hear about. APS recently announced the Solana Generating Station. Solana is a 280 megawatt solar power plant to be located just outside of Phoenix, Arizona. APS has signed a long-term contract with Abengoa Solar, the project developer and owner, for all of the electricity generated by this plant. If operating today, Solana would be the largest solar power plant in the world. The plant will use nearly three square miles of parabolic parabolic trough mirrors, and operating at full capacity, the plant will provide enough electricity for 70,000 homes. One of the most important aspects of this technology is its ability to capture and store energy for later use. By using large insulated tanks filled with molten salt, heat captured during the day can be stored and used to produce electricity when the sun is no longer shining. The value of this can't be underestimated. Because it can provide energy even after the sun has set, this technology provides the maximum value and it also provides reliability for APS and its customers. Solana also provides significant economic benefits to the state of Arizona. The Solana Generating Station will provide 1,500 construction jobs and 85 permanent operations jobs. But that's not the total environmental and economic impact. All total, Solana will result in over a billion dollars in economic development for the state of Arizona. Today, the single biggest obstacle to the success of Solana is the potential expiration of the 30 percent federal investment tax credit. Without this tax credit, Solana is simply not affordable today. I also need to be clear that a one- or two-year extension of the ITC is not sufficient. While it might not be preferable, it is usually acceptable for small-scale solar projects and for wind projects. But large-scale solar is different. It takes about three to four years to permit and construct a plant like Solana. And we can't begin building it until we know when it's finished, it's going to be eligible for the 30 percent investment tax credit. If a long-term extension of the investment tax credit is not granted, Solana will not be built. If the ITC is extended for a sufficient period of time, there will be many more plants like Solana in Arizona and in the desert southwest, developed in the next five to ten years. If not, the industry will lose its momentum and no large-scale solar plants will be built. The future of large-scale solar depends on getting those first few plants into operation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, for the opportunity to share this information with you. Um, thank you, Ms. Lockwood, very much. Our next uh, witness is Ms. Bianca Jaga, who is the chair of the World Future Council. Welcome. Could you move the microphone up a little bit uh, closer and turn it on? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for organizing this very important hearing. Uh, it is uh, an honor and a privilege to be here. Um, I have heard some very important testimonies about renewable energy and what has been done in the United States. Uh, perhaps I'd like to talk about the threat of global climate disaster that is no longer up for debate, and therefore um, renewable energy becomes a must and not just the question mark. The majority of scientists are in agreement. Governments have previously been reluctant to accept this reality. However, notwithstanding all this sobering information, the agreements reached in Bali were extremely weak and inadequate, and as you know, the role that the United States played in Bali was not the most encouraging. 
Climate change is the defining challenge of our age. How to meet that challenge while dealing with the already devastating consequences of floods, droughts, and rising temperatures remain the great unanswered question, and the time to answer is running out. In his final report, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change stated that the world must reverse the growth of greenhouse gas emissions by 2015 to avert a global climate disaster. If there is no action before 2012, that's too late, said Rajendra Pachuri, who headed the panel, who shared the Nobel Prize in October with former US President Al Gore. What we do in the next two to three years will depend and will determine our future. But what should we do? I used to believe that reduced energy consumption was an important first step, accompanied by research and investment into energy efficiency and renewable energy sources. I used to believe that it will be enough to encourage more localized lifestyle, reducing the need for overburdened pollutant transport ne networks. But after reading the most recent scientific findings, I have come to realize that even if we begin each of these practices in earnest tomorrow, it is simply not enough. The time has come to expose the myth that we can avert climate catastrophe by small measures and sticky plaster measures. In the recent assessment by the highly respected climate scientist James Hansen of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, he suggested that the IPCC report itself an alarming reading might even be absurdly optimistic. For example, the often touted safe figure of 3.6 Fahrenheit increase in average global temperatures is in fact not safe at all. We have already experienced a rise of 1.31 Fahrenheit in average global temperatures. A rise of 3.6 Fahrenheit is three times that agreeing to a 3.6 Fahrenheit target does not avoid the possibility of catastrophe. On top of this, the apparently bold target of reducing emissions by 50% does not guarantee that the temperature increase will be limited to 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Hansen estimates sea levels rises of four to five meters this century due to melting ice in Greenland and Antarctica. He described how the IPCC report fails to take geological records into account and ignores the so-called albedo flip property of water. The albedo flip property of ice water provides a powerful trigger mechanism, a climate forcing that flips the albedo of a sufficient portion of an ice sheet that can spark a cataclysm. Hansen is telling us that the poles do not melt in a linear fashion, but rather in burst, and that if the global if the globe warms up in just a few degrees, it might be enough to trigger a catastrophic ice sheet collapse. Such a collapse will not only drown most of the world's centers of population, but will itself fuel further climate change, since less ice means less heat reflected back into space. The Earth's climate is remarkably sensitive to global forcing. Positive and amplifying feedbacks predominate. This allowed the entire planet to be with so between climate state. Recent greenhouse gas emissions place the earth perilous close to dramatic climate change that could run out of control. If we go beyond the point where human intervention can no longer stabilize the system, then we precipitate unstoppable runaway climate change that will set in motion a major extinction event comparable to the five other extinction crises that the Earth has previously experienced. This clearly demonstrates what the World Future Council, the organization I chair, is advocating. If we are serious about averting climate change catastrophe, we must think in revolutionary terms and transform our way of life, restoring rather than destroying life on Earth. We must embark upon a global renewable energy revolution if we are to achieve the necessary carbon reduction by 2020. We must replace our carbon-driven economy with a renewable energy economy. There is no time to debate half measures any longer. The period in which they may have been effective has long been passed. We have experienced an industrial revolution. 
we have experienced a technological revolution. It will take a global renewable energy revolution, similar in scale and consequence to those two, to avert catastrophe. As Hermann Scheer, member of the German Bundestag and the World Future Council said, this cannot be achieved with the method of talk globally, postpone nationally, but only with the method of sing globally, act lo locally, regionally, and nationally. The beginning of this movement may already be underway. Some nations have begun to act, even finding great financial opportunities along the way. In Germany, pushes to where energy efficiency and renewable energy sources are spurring the economy. By 2020, every building must meet high levels of energy efficiency. The feed-in tariffs legislation, which guarantees a prefer preferential price for energy produced, will create 2,050,000 50, jobs. Mr. Jagger, uh, could you please um, summarize the statement? Sure. It will be crucially important for the United States, perhaps led by individual state, to adopt feeding tariffs as a significant way by which to accelerate the introduction of renewable energy. The U.S. cannot continue to rely on power in its city, its industries, its farm, and its transport system by energy resources for which there is ever greater global competition. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Jagger, very much. And our uh, final uh, witness is Mr. Tom Bias, who is the president of the National Farmers Union. Welcome, sir. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I, I am president of the National Farmers Union. We're 106 years old and represent a quarter of a million family farms and ranches around the country. We're here to say to you, Mr. Chairman, the members of the committee, that rural America is ready, willing, and able to do its part to help our nation solve probably our biggest economic, national security, and environmental challenge that we've ever faced. We have, uh, we have some experience in renewable energy over the past three decades. Uh, after the first oil embargo in the early 70s, a lot of people started talking about renewable energy and what we could do. We started out with a product called gasohol. It wasn't very uh, efficient, both economically or energy-wise, but it took about 30 years' worth of investment in technology in the industry, mostly by farmers, uh, mostly by local people. And we really didn't cross that threshold until the federal government stepped in with a renewable uh, fuel standard with a mandate which gave us certainty for a marketplace. We would hope that the same would happen in all types of renewable energy. We think a renewable portfolio standard is past due. Uh, last, uh, last year, we did a study um, on the potential benefits to rural America and our nation if you adopted a 20% uh, renewable portfolio standard for renewable electricity generation. And the production of electricity from wind alone would result in about a half a billion dollars in payments uh, to farmers and leases. Production of electricity from renewable biomass would result in about $25 billion to farmers growing these new crops. And 43 and a half to 66 billion in capital would be reinvested in these new clean energy facilities in rural America. The types of projects developed also play a critical role. A NAGRAL study compared the benefits of local ownership versus outside ownership and found that locally owned wind projects generate two and a half times more jobs and 3.1 times more rural economic benefits than those with outside ownership. Our policy uh, strongly encourages that any federal policies should provide incentives and foster the development of locally owned projects. Unfortunately, tapping rural America's clean energy potential is not likely to occur without the support of government policies. Community-based wind energy projects face additional hurdles because of limited capital access. It's becoming increasingly difficult to produce wind generation generators and associated equipment for community wind projects due to the size of those projects and the shift towards large-scale development processes, not just in the cost, but also in the infrastructure and access to the grid. Moreover, because the PTC can 
only be used against passive income, many community-based projects are not able to fully utilize uh, this provision. Uh, most interested parties uh, in these community projects are farmers and local uh, citizens that own the land with the potential for wind development, yet do not have sufficient levels of passive income necessary to, to utilize the tax break. We believe it is critical for the federal policy to continue to foster the development of renewable electricity projects. We support the extension of the PTC. We would hope that it would be a longer term so we would get the market certainty and investment in the technology that's necessary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would be glad to answer any questions. Great. Uh, thank you uh, very much. All time for statements by the uh, uh, witnesses uh, has expired. So now we'll turn to the question and answer period. The chair will recognize himself. Um, Mr. Abate, uh, you said how many new megawatts were installed for wind in 2007? In the United States, 5,244. 5,244. And uh, that represented uh, 30 percent of all new electricity installed in the country last year? All new nameplate capacity, 30 percent, correct. Second to only natural gas. Natural gas was what percent? Was, it was first, um, I believe it was about half. About 50 percent? Yeah. And I think it was about 10 percent was uh, coal, yep. uh, and the rest came from all other sources. So what would you predict would happen in 2008, this year, if uh, the, the uh, production tax credit is extended? Well, in two th in, uh, it's a good question. And, and when, you, when you look at our view, we can see the next couple of years. Um, the, the market is, is long on turbines right now, with a full confidence that the production tax credit will, right. tax credit will be extended. The performance for uh, these investors all have that in them. So in 2008, our production capacity, if you take what that's scaling to and doubling it, it will be between 7 and 8 gigawatts. 7 and 8,000 new megawatts. Yep. Uh, 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 and on top of only 5,200 this year. Right. So what would it project out to then for 2009? What is, in other words, what's the, what's the um, projection in terms of new wind power? Yeah, if, if, uh, if you just take our order book and what we're seeing as far as demand in the market, um, with a stable policy by 2010, this country could be well over 10 gigawatts. 10,000 megawatts yeah. every year being produced. Yes. And how many new nuclear power uh, megawatts will come online this year in the United States? Do you know? Uh, none. How many next year? Do you know? Uh, same. How many in 2010? Do you know? For some time, it'll be uh, it'll be zero. Zero. So and, and the reason is capacity to be able to pull that off and the investment and, and the long-term cycle of that, of that technology. So in other words, if there's 10,000 new megawatts every year for 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and it could actually get larger, huh? So there could be 100,000 new megawatts of wind installed in the United States before the first 1,000 megawatts of nuclear power comes online. That's a reasonable assessment, yes. Uh, Mr. Unger, do you think that's a reasonable assessment? But, you know, the market will speak Could you move in and turn on the microphone, Sorry. please? Yeah, I think, I think the market will speak to that. One of the things that I look at is who's willing to finance these projects. Public markets, investment bankers and the like are very willing to fund wind projects, very willing to fund geothermal projects, willing to fund biomass projects. It doesn't appear to be an appetite today to fund nuclear projects. The French are building, uh, I think, the most advanced nuclear uh, technology plant in the world today has $2 billion and it's already years behind schedule. So it's quite a bit of uncertainty in the construction costs before they can even come online. And the generating costs, which are higher than that of wind, certainly don't include what we do with the waste. So it, it, it creates uncertainty, which investors are unhappy about. And, and as he says, if we have certainty about tax credits, then we have certainty about tying up our money. Venture capitalists have their money for 10 years. And we'd like to have that kind of certainty. So, so you're saying that um, you agree with Mr. Bates' um, uh, projection for how rapidly this is going to increase oh, in the completely. wind sector? Completely. Or, it, or is he even being conservative? He may be being conservative. The nice thing about wind is the, and solar is that, you know, I, we were having this conversation before. Some states are blessed with a lot of sun. Some are blessed with a lot of wind. You can scale these plants. The kind of commercial plants we're talking about here are very, very large. But in rural America, where there's you know, fewer access to uh, 
to generation lines and the other and the like. You can also have smaller plants like this, which create a lot of local jobs around local economies. It's very difficult to do that with very large coal-fired or nuclear-fired plants. So, and Ms. Lockwood, what do you think is the potential in Arizona for solar power uh, by 2015? What, how many megawatts do you think you can be uh, producing? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe with the long-term extension of the ITC, you could see um, well over 1,000 megawatts of uh, large-scale solar built in Arizona alone by 2015, probably even more than that. Probably even more than that. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, this is all before the first nuclear power plant comes online uh, after 25 years. So that's, that's pretty big news in terms of uh, what is happening out in the marketplace with an extension of the uh, production tax credit for renewable uh, energy. Uh, and uh, uh, at this point, my time has expired. I'll turn and recognize the uh, gentleman from Wisconsin. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, we've been on kind of a perpetual debate uh, on tax credit extenders. Ways and Means Committee doesn't want to make is any of these things permanent, which I believe is a mistake. Uh, but anyway. that frankly, is the way it is. Uh, we may end up uh, getting to the business of prioritizing uh, tax extenders to get something through the Senate. Um, I'd like to ask each of you that's kind of in the business, uh, which two tax extenders would you prioritize as to being the top two? And I would throw in uh, uh, the R&D tax credit as well in terms of uh, incentivizing new technologies. So put that on the table. So let's start with you, Mr. Abate. Yeah, I think um, a full value production tax credit would be number one for as, as long as that can work and, and get it through. Um, and as, as I had said, because of the performance that our customers have, uh, have counted on, that's what's in their model. So anything different than that would be a, a disruption in our view. Uh, second is investment tax credit for some of the large capital uh, projects, um, you know, wind is more of a production base. The the investment tax credit would be would be number two. Okay. Mr. Sweezy, uh, Congressman, I'll go back to your original statement that I I believe uh, sincerely that we need a diverse portfolio of energy resources. I'm asking for priorities. I know you want it all. We might well not be able from to give from it all. from my company's perspective, we're very interested in extension of the solar uh, credit. Uh, long-term extension to give um, uh, okay. security to the to the and what's number predictability two? and um, we're very interested in the R&D tax credit as well because okay. we Mr. have a Unger. very very large R&D function at our Mr. company. Mr. Unger, I think we would be looking for tax credits that would not select one industry over the other. We are specifically looking for a playing field that allow a variety of solutions to okay. compete. Number one, so, and number two. So, if any of the tax credits exclude others, then I think we're trying to play economic policy. So R&D across the board would be good. You know, production tax credits across all technologies, not to consider one technology over the okay, other. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Lockwood? Um, Congressman Sensenbrenner, our first priority would be the long-term extension of the investment tax credit because of our solar resource in Arizona. Number two would be the production tax credit. Okay. Ms. Jagger? Um, Congressman, um, I think that a I would like to talk about uh, a proposal that was made yesterday. I'm, I'm asking which tax credits were the top two priorities. Well, I think an all across technology tax credit, but I will support as well the fitting in tariff, tariff okay. that was um, introduced yesterday by uh, Congressman Jay Inslee. Okay, Mr. Bruce. Uh, production tax credit. I'm sorry. The, the PTC and also the, the VTEC, which uh, uh, helps the ethanol and biodiesel. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I yield back the balance of my time. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from South Dakota, Ms. Herseth Stanley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Bias, thank you for your testimony today and the study that the National Farmers Union has done. Uh, Chairman Markey and I have discussed the issue of the transmission capacity in getting these wind resources out of the Great Plains and other parts of the country, and we know how important that will be to fully maximize the benefits that the wind energy and the solar energy in certain areas across rural America have. But I, I entirely agree with you as well 
about the importance of the local ownership and the local use uh, of wind energy rather than just exporting these renewable sources out of the states uh, that have the most abundant source. So you have stated in a number of areas in your testimony the importance of that local investment, the importance of uh, altering the PTC uh, to serve as an incentive for that local ownership and investment and development, community-based wind energy, the community-based energy development like we have seen in Minnesota. Could you talk in, in just a little bit greater terms about where we need to make changes in Federal policy as well as working with our counterparts in the State legislatures, whether that is with net metering or other op options available, to assist farmers and ranchers and rural families not just in the lease payments they get for turbines on their land owned by larger wind farms and selling those to larger utilities, but how we can do more to benefit those rural economies based on some of the statistics you gave in job creation? Uh, thank you, uh, Congresswoman Herseth. I, uh, I, I think you captured a lot of what's really going on in rural America. Uh, every farmer, every rancher, every local person I've met in the past two years are so excited about the opportunity uh, to help uh, develop energy, not just ethanol, not just uh, biodiesel, but wind and solar. And, and we have these obstacles. The state of Minnesota, as you referred to, has a community-based requirement for any renewable energy developed in that state, 10% uh, has to be community-owned. And that is to carve out some local own ownership. You know, uh, we have seen in the past in the production of farm commodities, when that ownership goes away, uh, the, the money follows. It is taken out of those communities. It is not reinvested in those communities. And the beauty about ethanol has been, it has been local ownership. The single largest owners and, and producers of ethanol today are not the big multinational grain companies. It is farmers and local communities. They own 40 percent of the ethanol production. That gets reinvested in the community. You see boards coming off the storefronts instead of going up. If we allow this, whether it is ethanol or wind or solar, uh, to all be taken out of that local control where they are just uh, paying for a footprint on a wind tower, uh, I think we will lose those jobs, we will lose those benefits, and we will lose a tremendous opportunity. Uh, thank you. And then the only other uh, point I would make is the further work that we will do with you and Chairman Mark if we can pursue this, the issue of the PTC, how it is structured, because it is currently only against the passive income. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Great. Thank you. Uh, General Lady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And as many of you know, I spent uh, two decades of my career in the wind in industry business, and I, I understand exactly how the production tax credit affects the industry and how the cyclical pattern has put us way behind uh, the Europeans and other uh, parts of the world. Uh, Mr. Unger, I have a question. Uh, what percentage of your production of new machines is being sold to overseas customers? Mr. Unger. Mr. Abate, you said or Unger? I am sorry, Mr. Abate. Sorry. Oh, um, about uh, 30 percent. And what percentage of those are produced overseas, uh, of the 30 percent? Those are produced overseas. So it is fair to say that, in your opinion, um, if we extend the production tax credit, many more jobs will be created in the United States. Oh, yeah. Uh, 70 percent are landing here in the United States. Um, and, and a big part is, I think, as you have a production tax credit here, more components, more machines will land here. If that changes, our customers who land these, these pieces of equipment are looking to go to other parts of the world. So if you, produce if you sell machines here, you both produce them here and you create jobs in the field with maintenance and, and insulation. Right. Uh, most of the, the work that goes into producing a windmill is that all work produced here in the United States, or do you import products from overseas? No, um, the assembly occurs here. Uh, components we do source globally, but a lot of the components, due to their size, blades will be here, towers will be here. Um, you know, components, electronical components can be global, uh, but logistics make up about 20 percent of the cost of a wind project, so it really forces that technology to be local relative to where the equipment is going to land. Thank you. And, um, Mr. Sweeney, I think it was very 
um, illustrative that m all of your production is, is being sold overseas now, and, and that's uh, a terrific loss for the United States of America. How can we incentivize customers here to start buying your products and installing them here in our, in our country? Right. All our customers for our thin film uh, solar equipment line are, are overseas, and that has to do, as I explained, both in terms of the uh, incentives for locating production, but also the end-use market. Uh, the, the panels that, we're, that our technology produces are five-point square meter panels. I mean, they're, they're based on flat panel display uh, technology on glass. These are very large panels, and uh, it makes sense to try to locate these production facilities uh, near the end-use load. And um, uh, we believe that, that if we do have a, um, a clear, consistent, long-term policy uh, towards solar uh, in the U.S. that we'll see more uh, manuf some of this manufacturing occurring in the U.S. for that reason because it'll build the market. The U.S. market today is only t is only 10 percent of the entire global photovoltaic industry. Yet we generate 25 percent of the global uh, electricity. So there's a disconnect there between how much we're doing here on s in, in solar and what the rest of the world is doing. Thank you, Ms. Jagger. What steps of the European uh, governments are most effective, uh, in your opinion, in developing new energy technologies uh, and, and implementing that? I think that until now, the most effective have been, has been Germany and the feeding in tar tariff that was introduced by um, the Member of Parliament, Mr. Herman Scheer. I think I had the most um, effect, and they have been able to produce about 200,000, between 200,000 and 250,000 jobs. So that's what I was talking about with Congressman Jay Insee, together with the organization that I chair yesterday, um, introduced um, the t tariff legislation or, or policy uh, in this country. And it will be really important that his, um, his policy be supported. I think it will make a big difference for this country. They are about 40 countries uh, that have already, in, you know, embark or embrace uh, the feeding tariff around the world. Okay, thank you, uh, and I reserve. Or gentleman's time has expired. We appreciate that. We, just, we have a series of roll calls on the floor, and we're trying to ensure that each member who's here gets a chance to ask some questions. Mr. Engel is here as a special guest of the Select Committee. We'll recognize him for the purpose of asking. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's good to be a, a special guest, uh, Ms. Jagger. Um, in your testimony, uh, you said, um, I was struck by uh, your remarks that you used to believe that reduced energy consumption was an important first step and used to believe that it would be enough to encourage more localized lifestyles, but you now say you realize that that's not enough. Um, I, I also uh, have come to that conclusion, as have many members of Congress, and I think it's important to, uh, to keep saying um, I, I'm embarrassed that, that our, our country uh, has not uh, agreed to, to sign uh, international agreements uh, that uh, would um, would help uh, with global warming, but um, countries like India and China, uh, who have been exempted from these things, um, I really believe that if there are new international uh, agreements, that that countries like India and, and China, which are now becoming uh, more responsible for for global warming, need to be included uh, in these agreements as well. Would 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 you agree? What I will say, um, Congressman, is that it is, um, it is vital that the United States realize that they need to sign on to a Kyoto Plus Treaty. It is vital as well that the industrialized nations of the world realize that they need to come up with a reduction of CO2 emission that is, um, that is realistic and not just simply what they think they can do, because otherwise we will not be able to avert a climate, um, a climate change catastrophe. With regards to India and, and China, uh, I think that it is very important that we supply and that the, we help them with um, providing renewable energy uh, technology. What is important as well to understand for certain countries is that we cannot make them accountable for what we in the developed world have been responsible. Therefore, we have to keep that in mind, that it will be totally um, unfair 
if tomorrow we ask from China, um, India, or Brazil to come up and sign the exact kind of agreement that we'll be requiring from the United States or from an European country. How about Brazil, since you, since you mentioned Brazil? Um, I noticed in, in your testimony, you know, you, you, you said that um, uh, ethanol and, and nuclear are not, are not a uh, solution. Um, yet I was just in Brazil and was amazed at um, the, the amount of, uh, how much they, ahead they are of this country in terms of planning for the future and in, in looking at alternative energies and, and, and weaning uh, their country uh, away from, from uh, gasoline and, and things like that. Do you think we could learn something from Brazil? Well, um, <clears throat> there are certain policies that are being implemented in Brazil that I will question. I mean, I think that we have to realize that the use of, of biofuels and bioethanol, uh, some of those technologies, can lead us to have a humanitarian catastrophe because we will be using um, farmland that should be used for feeding people rather than for uh, be used as, as fuel. I mean, uh, one thing that I'd like to mention is that um, that 200, we require 200 times more surface area are required to produce energy from crops as compared with energy from photovoltaic cells. Thank you. Uh, I know, Mr. Chairman, uh, we have votes, so I, 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 I don't questioning, want, and I, I thank I, you for letting me I don't me want the gentleman to miss the roll call. There's now under one minute left to go to uh, go approximately a quarter of a mile to uh, make the roll call on the House floor. Well, it's good exercise. It'll contribute uh, to global uh, against global warming, or I guess you know, if we if we walk on our own and don't ride. Let's let's uh, let's stop walk that walk then, because we will miss the roll calls otherwise. But I, I think that it's it's pretty clear from the um, panel today uh, that the extension of uh, the production tax credits, the incentive to this industry is going to result by 2015 in 100,000 uh, megawatts of, of renewable energy, electricity in our country, minimum. Uh, and by the way, there's only 100,000 megawatts of nuclear power in the United States today after 50 years of federal subsidies. So no one should be embarrassed about the fact that we're going to give a relatively modest break to the competition to uh, nuclear and other energy resources. I think rural America is ready to go. We have to solve the transmission issues. If we get the tax issues right, uh, then we can have a revolution that uh, produces uh, 15, 20, 25 percent of the electricity in our country and sends a signal to the rest of the world that we are serious. We thank all of you. You are great leaders. Uh, with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.